Good morning and welcome to FCC. As we continue our series on church, we're thinking today about the mission God has given us as a church. Now, famous last words can be revealing. They can be amusing. Last words are for fools who have not said enough, Karl Marx. Or I'm bored of it all, Winston Churchill's last words. Friends applaud the comedy is finished, said Beethoven at his death. Either the wallpaper goes or I go. Oscar Wilde's last words. What were the last words of Jesus recorded? And what do they tell us about his priorities for us as a church? We're probably familiar with the last words that Matthew records in his gospel. Therefore go, Jesus says, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always until the very end of the age. You may well also know the last words of Jesus that Luke records for us in Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's something so significant in these last words of Jesus to a, a newly born church who are confused and in need of guidance. Go and be my witnesses, empowered by my spirit to make disciples of all nations. This is a mission Jesus gives his disciples and it's the same mission God has given us here in Silverton 2,000 years later. Go and be my witnesses, Jesus says. And it's this aspect of church that we're thinking of today. And of course, it's not just one part of what we do as church. This is, if you like, our defining feature. It, it, it's who we are, why we exist. If you go look at the sign outside the church, it says we follow Jesus and we share Jesus. And these two are intrinsically linked. We follow Jesus as we share Jesus. But it's a mission, if we're honest, I guess most of us find pretty difficult at times. We struggle or we waste opportunities to witness to Jesus. Maybe we fear others' opinions of us more than we fear God. We feel silly. We feel like we don't know what to say. Well, today's passage helps us to think about the mission of church to be witnesses of Jesus. And it's, it's immensely practical and applied. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, Peter's writing to Christians who are scattered across the whole region. And he describes them as strangers and aliens. They don't fit in the world. And as a result, they're, they're being persecuted for their faith in Christ. And Peter's urging them not to blend in with the world nor to fight it, nor to retreat into some sort of Christian ghetto, but rather to live out their faith in a pagan world, even in the face of persecution, and to witness to Jesus through living differently, by standing out and by taking every opportunity to speak of him. I'm going to read these verses um, and then I've got four headings as we consider what Peter's saying and how we can apply it to us today and some of these headings I should say come straight from the book that we've been looking at love your church here so I'm going to read uh, 1 Peter 3 from verse 13 to 18 1 Peter 3 uh, verse 13 who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good but even if you should suffer for what is right you are blessed do not fear their threats do not be frightened but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander for it's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now we see then four things. Firstly, evangelism begins in our hearts. I, I So far I've used the phrase make disciples and being witnesses. These are Jesus's words. 
but we often call this evangelism, which is linked to the name of the church, evangelical. And it, it comes from the word evangel, which just means gospel, good news. So evangelism, like witnessing and making disciples, simply means sharing with words the good news of Jesus. And this is our calling as a church and as individuals. And it, it should be something we, we kind of work together at as a team. But despite all the excuses we may come up with as to why we don't do it. I didn't know what to say. I was frightened of being asked questions. I wasn't ready. I felt silly. Sharing Jesus begins not with the right methodology. It's not essential to take all the courses, to read all the books. It simply begins in the heart. It's as we love Jesus, as we think of him and look to him and listen to him. And as we contemplate how truly wonderful he is, that we will want to talk about him. You don't need to be told to talk about something you love. It's easy. It comes naturally to you. I know it does. I went to watch Ipswich play Plymouth last Saturday and I, I, and I may well have bored you about this already uh, because I enjoyed it. It was a great day out. OK, we uh, we missed a number of key chances. We didn't win, but we uh, we we played well. And then a couple of days later, we went to the team who had won every game at home and we beat them 4-1. And, uh, and I'm feeling pretty optimistic about the season. Uh, the new team Ipswich have put together. Now, I just I'm just doing this because it, it's so easy and natural, isn't it, to talk about something we love. It may be a sports team you like to watch or, or, or a person, the person you fell in love with. Or a piece of music you love to listen to. Or, or a gripping novel you've just finished. Or the artist who inspires you. You just want to share this love with others. And you do so naturally. And you speak passionately in conversation. Because your heart has been captured by a love for something or someone. And of course it should be just the same when it comes to the mission God has given us. It begins in our hearts. It's as we love Jesus that we should not be able to stop wanting to talk about him unless we love something or someone else more. So verse 15 says, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. And setting apart means to sanctify. In our hearts we, we, we are to set apart as holy. We acknowledge him. And, and in particular, we set apart Christ as Lord. Where? In our hearts, it says. Jesus is Lord, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, our affections, our worship, our praise. And this is where speaking about Jesus must start, in our hearts. As we set apart Jesus as Lord, acknowledging him, setting him apart as holy, as the Lord of our lives. This must be where we begin. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Is he your first and greatest love? Then he must define you and shape all you do and say. And this will be the only motivation we need to speak of him. So that's the first thing we see here. Secondly, we must redirect our fears. Nowhere in the Bible are Christians promised an easy life. These verses I've just read talk about church suffering for what is right, talk about others trying to harm us, talk about talks about threats that we might be afraid of, uh, being spoken of maliciously and slandered, suffering for doing good. This is what is promised to the Christian who takes up his cross daily and walks in the path of Jesus. It's not for the faint hearted. We've seen this increasingly in our country over recent years, a growing intolerance of the Christian faith. The exclusive claims of Jesus Christ are no longer welcome. The morality of the Ten Commandments is now far too restrictive. Or the teaching of Jesus on issues of sexuality and marriage, gender are simply abhorrent. And anyone dares speak up must be aggressively called out by our secular, inclusive world that doesn't feel all that inclusive to many Christians. Some Christians have lost their job in this country for, for holding and promoting a, a, a Christian view that has not been welcomed. But it's very often just the snide comments, uh, the kind of patronising put down, the mocking voice. 
And I'm sure that the two biggest reasons we don't do evangelism are, firstly, we are not setting apart Jesus as Lord in our hearts. We thought about that. But secondly, we are simply too fearful of others. And it's understandable, isn't it? If church faces persecution, then why don't we just keep our heads down, dilute the message, keep it to ourselves and choose the path of least resistance? Surely that's easier. But people need to hear the good news. Just as we needed someone to share the gospel with us. We're all here because someone in our life, whether our parents or a friend or a church leader, broke that pain barrier and spoke to us of the Lord Jesus. And the key here that stops us from being ineffective is, uh, is, is that need to redirect our fears. When we look at other people and hear their, their sometimes subtle, but when we hear their threats, we can feel overwhelmed and we can feel weak and vulnerable. But when we look to God and see his awesome power and marvel at his holiness, then our fears are brought back into perspective. When we look at our fears, they seem so big. But when we look at God, we see how much bigger he is. So verse 14, it says, but even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Peter's quoting here from Isaiah 8, and it's worth just looking at this for a minute. I'm just going to read Isaiah 8, verses 12 and 13, and spot the sort of links with this passage. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. We're not to fear other people and what they can do to us. Peter's already said that if we suffer for doing good, we are in fact blessed by God. And in um, Isaiah 8, regarding the Lord as holy, it, it, it literally means to sanctify him or to set him apart as holy, to revere him. That's exactly what 1 Peter 3, 15 tells us to do, setting apart the Lord as holy in our hearts. But here it's specifically Jesus Christ we're to regard as, or revere as holy. And as we're not to fear man and to set apart God as holy, so Isaiah 8 tells us we are to fear God instead of man. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. This is the sort of antidote to fear of people. It is to have a fear or a right understanding of God. What about Jesus? What does he say? Jesus, the most loving man who's ever existed, what does he say about this? Well, listen, it's pretty stark what Jesus says. These words are from Luke 12, four, uh, four to five. Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that could do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So why do we fear other people so much? I know fear of what others think of me or will say about me and their opinion of me matters far too much to me. And I know there have been times when I, I have wasted opportunities to share Jesus with someone because I, I simply fear these things too much. The reality is that we should all fear God a lot more than we do. Now, I don't mean be scared or terrified of him, but really just to see him for who he is, bigger than our fears, the one we are to revere and honour and to set apart as holy, even if others will persecute us. If uh, it, it is unloving of us not to share the good news of Jesus, if we believe that Jesus alone is their only hope. If we're to be effective in the mission God has given us, we need to redirect our fears. We'll need to see other people for who they are, not be blind to the reality of, of suffering for Jesus. This is what we're to expect, but we will need to fear God more. We want to honour him in our lives so that we do speak of Jesus, even if it will be costly to us. And the third thing that in these verses I want us to consider is goodness prompts questions. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do 
good. It's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Goodness is what God wants to see in us. And these verses assume that we will be asked by non-Christians to give a reason for the hope we have in Jesus. I wonder how your hope levels are. Can others spot your hope in Christ? Can people see that my hope is in Jesus? Because the way they will see our hope in Jesus is by the way we live. And 1 Peter is all about us living godly lives that point to Jesus. Our behaviour and our words are two sides of the same coin. So if you look back to chapter 2 and verse 1, Therefore rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Or chapter 2 and verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You see, our goodness, or, or rather our godliness, must be on display for all to see. This is a real challenge that will lead others to ask the questions. For example, I've, I've been asked a number of times when I've been around uh, groups of people who swear lots. People have said to me, Andy, you don't swear, do you? Why don't you? And it's given me a real opportunity to talk about my faith. Let me just... Um, read a, a, a short paragraph from this book. Many Christians have been trained to answer some of the basic questions that people might ask about faith, and that's wonderful. But what they don't know how, but but sorry, but they don't know how to get the conversation started. Here's Peter's model: bless and do good to people, live an attractive life under the lordship of Christ that provokes questions. The fruit of the spirit displayed in our practical actions in life can make a tremendous impact on a watching world. It's interesting how a joyful, gentle, loving and peaceful person really stands out today. Let's devote our lives to putting on displays of the goodness of Jesus in practical acts of service to our neighbour. And fourthly then, fourth thing to consider is the call to always be ready. So look with me again at verse 15. Verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keep a clear conscience. So those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. We are to always be ready. When people see us living for God, when people see that we are full of hope, it will lead them to question what they see. Sometimes we prompt questions to be asked. Often, I find, by asking lots of questions ourselves and, and showing a real, genuine interest in others. If you ask someone on a Monday morning at work, what did you do yesterday? They will probably ask you the same question. What will you say? I went to church and heard a talk about how we should share our faith. And just maybe that will prompt a question back and, and open up a fruitful conversation, perhaps. This is not aggressive. This is loving and gentle. I think this means with a large dose of, of humility we're to do this. Because we don't have all the answers. We don't pretend to. But we are interested in people's lives. So we do ask lots of questions. We tell lots of stories like Jesus did, which are such good ways of communicating truth gently. And as we ask questions, what do you think about this? That's really interesting. Tell me more. Tell me why you believe that. We open up conversation we, and we help people to start thinking about the things ultimately that really matter. We don't have to be the ones always on the defensive. Ask questions. Ask others to defend their position, which perhaps they've never actually really considered. But we do answer to. We're not afraid to say something of the Lord Jesus when the opportunity arises. Do you have a good gospel outline? Can you articulate clearly what it is you believe? If not, then it's well worth uh, 
looking at this, considering, learning a gospel outline. It's such a helpful thing. I like the way Jeremy does this. He shared with us. He, he likes to use the line, that's what I love about Jesus. How natural, how beautiful, just to get the conversation onto Jesus. That's what I love about Jesus. With uh, the fears that COVID's led to, it's great to have this hope to be able to lovingly share it because the world has so little hope. I was reading somewhere about three questions to use in evangelism. Would you like to come to dinner or coffee? And just, just get to know the person, listen to what makes them tick, ask lots of questions. Would you like to come for dinner? Would you like to come to church for me? Would you like to read the Bible with me? Because God's word is powerful to convict sinners of their need for Christ. The words of the Bible have so much more power than you do. It's good to be thinking about questions people have. It's a great website called bethinking.org, um, bethinking.org, which has so many of these kind of apologetic questions and some really helpful answers. So consider how we might answer some of the popular questions that your non-Christians have. See, the word Peter uses in verse 15, uh, translated reason, give a reason, is uh, our word apology, but it doesn't mean being sorry. Uh, we talk about Christian apologetics. It, it's being ready to give a defence or a reason for what we believe. We don't have to be perfect, but we do need to say something of Jesus. However weak and fearful we may be, because God uses us and our stumbling, faltering attempts to present people with the truth of Jesus and the call to turn to him in repentance and faith. And there's no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. But we are to do this, Peter writes, with gentleness and respect. Gentleness is, is a humility. Gentleness, we have. Respect, I think, is more likely respect for God. I think it ties in with what we've considered, how we're to fear God more than we fear other people. And then in verse 18, we get this wonderful reminder that we've considered uh, in church as we shared communion of just how wonderful the good news of Jesus is that we're called to bear witness to. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. How wonderful. So this is our mission. It begins as we set apart Jesus as Lord in our hearts. It requires us to redirect our fears and to fear God more than man. It involves living good lives, living distinctively for Christ. And it needs us to always be ready to give a reason. Sometimes the initiative, uh, we, 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 we take the initiative, we, we can be proactive. Because this is what God has called us to do. And, and everyone needs to hear the good news of Jesus. How the sinless saviour died for them. To pay for their sins. To bring them to God. Without faith in this Jesus. We're lost. We're without hope. And the book we've been reading. Encourages us to think practically about. Which non-Christians God has placed in your life. Why don't we all think now. Of, of perhaps just three non-Christian people we know. Maybe family or friends, neighbours, or colleagues at work, and then commit to pray for them. And why don't you share those names with, with somebody else in church, maybe somebody in your home group perhaps, and then pray every day for them. Pray for opportunities to lovingly share your hope in Christ with them, for God to be at work in their lives, for an opportunity to maybe give them a Christian book or a leaflet or um, uh, or for an opportunity to invite them to church or to read the Bible with you or just for them to ask you about your faith and then pray and pray and pray and look for opportunities and ask God, God, don't be subtle with me. Be obvious and clear in the opportunities you give me. And this is a prayer that I'm sure God will want to answer. I'm going to finish by just showing a short video from Passion for Life, just different people sharing how they find this, uh, this, this aspect of sharing our faith. And I hope this will be helpful to you. Let me just pray. Father, thank you so much for the good news of Jesus. Please help us as a church to be effective witnesses, sharing the good news 
of Jesus with others. Help us, we pray. Help us to fear you more than we fear other people and help us to set apart Jesus as Lord in our hearts. And we ask this for your honour and glory. Amen. Thanks very much for listening. Do enjoy this uh, short clip. I think you have to have the right time to share your faith. I don't th think I'm a person who could just go in cold. Um, but I also believe that if you're stuck for words, God would give you those words and open up an opportunity for you to take to share the gospel with them. So sometimes, you know, when I feel prompted to share the gospel with another dog walker, I'll share with them that I feel a bit awkward because it's not a conversation that I normally have every day with people. And it's not a name. You don't often hear people speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ in conversation. So I share with them that I, I, I feel a bit awkward doing that. And I, I hope you understand. And, and I, I just, but I do feel the need to share the Lord Jesus Christ with you. And that immediately for them, I found has brings down a barrier. They don't feel threatened by that. And they just see that I'm, I'm, just honestly trying to share a, a message. Um, and I'm not an expert. So the way I'd want to encourage someone uh, sort of to, in the area of evangelism, I think, is just to say that uh, the experience of sharing the gospel is never, ever one that you regret. I remember kind of sort of, uh, when I first became a Christian, going to Christians in Sport uh, sort of events. And I remember Dano from Christians in Sport uh, sort of articulating this really well. And he says that it is like a pain line. You know, you kind of, it's that first contact in one sense that is the worst or the, mo the thing we're often scared about the most. Um, but honestly, there's never been a conversation about Jesus that I've ever regretted. And I've, uh, I've missed a lot of opportunities with evangelism and there's a lot of regret um, from sort of my time at uni. But there's never, ever been a conversation about Jesus that has been uh, regretted. The thing that gets me across the, f the fear is knowing the consequences if I don't share. If someone is bound for hell and I don't share, well, I might be found a wee bit guilty there have not blown the trumpet to one person. So yes, love for the person would get me over the fear that it's more important to share Jesus than for me to feel, oh, or whatever. <laughs>